Hello, church family. I hope you're ready for the Word of God. Today, we're going to begin a series of seven messages on the I Am statements of Jesus. We're doing this for the Lenten season as there is a time of reflection, contemplation, and drawing closer to Jesus in love and repentance. And we want everybody to understand how Jesus is all sufficient. He's everything that we need. And every issue we have, every challenge of life, Jesus Christ is all we need. Today we're going to focus on Jesus' statement, I am the bread of life. We're going to be focusing on the statement that was made in John chapter 6 when he said that. But before we begin, the context of this is that Jesus fed multitudes of people, thousands of people with a few bread and a few loaves, a few pieces of bread and loaves. And because of that, they wanted to make him a king. Uh, they wanted to force him to be their ruler. Uh, they started following him everywhere. And he was about to tell them why their motives were wrong. And from that point on, we're going to pick up the story in John chapter 6. And we look at verse 31. The Jews said to Jesus, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So it's referring back to the time when the Jews went out of Egypt. They were in the wilderness of 40 years, and during that time, God fed them manna, little loaves of bread, little wafers from heaven. And they said that our, father, or our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. God gave them bread from heaven, and then Jesus said, Verse 32, truly I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. So what Jesus is saying there is, first of all, he corrected them by telling them that it wasn't Moses. Some of them almost worshipped Moses, uh, but that came from God. It wasn't Moses. The second thing Jesus was doing here was saying that this bread that they got in the wilderness was really a type and a shadow of the true bread from heaven who is to come in the future. And of course, we know now in the New Testament, Jesus is the true bread from heaven. He's the Messiah. He goes on to explain, verse 33, For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. So what Jesus is telling them, basically, is everything that happened in the Old Testament, whether it was the rock that followed them and gave them water, whether it was the bread from heaven, whether it was the deliverance out of Egypt from bondage and slavery, whether it was the Red Sea parting, everything somehow was depicting who Jesus was and what Messiah was going to do when he came. So Jesus is the fulfillment of the whole story of Israel. We see only one part of that story here when it comes to the manna or the bread from heaven. And then Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe." All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to the will of him who sent me. And so we see Jesus continuing to explain the significance of the manner in, uh, as we find in the book of Exodus, the manner they received in the wilderness. He's saying that that was pointing to him as the bread of life. And then he said, if you come to me, you will not hunger and you will not thirst. Later on, he said that your fathers ate of the bread in the wilderness and they died, meaning it was only temporary. It was only a material blessing. It only sustained them for a small part of the day. But what he was doing was coming to sustain us for eternity. Uh, so he teaches us to pray, give us our, this day our daily bread. And he's talking about providing our needs. But in that prayer of the Lord's Prayer, which, again, was going back to the, the Exodus story, is that Jesus is basically telling us that if we go to him, our provisions will be met, not just bread, 
but everything that we need, including eternal life. So he said, I am the bread of life. If you come to me, you will not hunger, meaning the longing of your soul will be satisfied, not just the longing of your stomach. It's not just meeting the needs of your belly. It's meeting the needs of the bottomless pit that you have inside of you that longs for eternal significance and meaning. And so he is the bread of life. We come to him. We will never hunger. We will never thirst. Uh, It reminds me of the, the next chapter when he said that if you come to him and you believe in him, out of the abundance of your heart will flow rivers of living water. He said to the woman at the well in chapter 4, that if you drink of the well of this world, you will thirst again. But if you drink the water that I give you, you will never thirst. So he uses the physical things of this world as a metaphor to depict the awesomeness of who he is and how we are to look to him for everything in our life. He says, I will give you a bread in which you'll never hunger, you'll never thirst. You've seen me, yet you do not believe. Then he said, verse 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. And so if you're longing for Jesus, come to him. He'll never turn you away. He'll never cast you out. He'll never shame you. He'll never put guilt upon you. He'll never drive you away from his presence. And if you have initial guilt that leads to repentance, that is a good kind of guilt. It's not the condemnation that is the bad kind of guilt that makes you run from God. And so he's saying that if you come to Jesus, even right now while I'm still speaking, he'll never reject you. So you need to consider this even as I'm speaking. If you don't have a relationship with God or if you've fallen away from God, Come to Jesus even before I end the message. So those who come to him, he will never drive away. Your friends may neglect you. Your spouse may reject you. Your parents may abandon you. But Jesus said, if you come to me, I will never cast you out. For I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Meaning... He is representative of the Father, of the love of God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so Jesus is a perfect image, a perfect representative of who God the Father is. So if Jesus would never reject us, then he's saying God the Father would never reject you. And so he goes on to say in verse 39, and this is the will of him, meaning the Father who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who believes and looks on the Son would have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So now he's talking about the immediacy of eternal life. As soon as you believe in Jesus, you have eternal life. But then he's promising us that even at the last day of time, At the end of human history, there's going to be a final day of judgment. The Christians will be judged for their works. They'll be saved. But those who don't know the Lord will be judged for their sins. They will not be saved for eternity. So what Jesus is saying is if you believe in him, you will be raised up at the last day. And what is he talking about? Well, our physical body goes into the ground and returns to dust. But at the last day, as it is talked about and taught in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it talks about God raising our bodies up in the twinkling of an eye and transmuting it so that it becomes that supernaturally natural body that Jesus had after he rose from the dead. He was able to walk through walls, but he wasn't a spirit because he was able to eat. You could touch him. It's some kind of supernaturally uh, natural body that science can't explain, but somehow God is going to unite us with our bodies. The moment we pass away from this world now, we're with the presence of God. Our spirit goes to be with him. But he's talking about here, we're going to be united with our physical body, but it'll be a glorified body. Uh, That's exciting. So he's talking about the immediacy of the eternal life. We have that relationship with God. 
We know we're children of God. We know our sins are forgiven. We know we could pray. We know we could walk in His presence. We know we could feel His presence. We know we could receive uh, when we pray in faith. We can commune with God. We could fellowship with God. We could fellowship with all of those who believe in Christ in our local churches and congregations. It's amazing. Eternal life is the greatest gift they will ever receive, out, ever receive outside of Jesus himself. But then he's promising us eternity with him, united with our glorified body. It's, it's quite amazing what he's talking about here. Uh, so he's given us doctrinal, uh, and some people fancy words, eschatological language here of the last days. Eschatology has to do with the last days. So he's bringing out the immediacy of eternal life, but he's also talking about the final things of eschatology here. And he said that this is the will of God, that he doesn't lose any of those the Father has given him. And so what he's saying here is those who believe in him, it's God the Father's gift to Jesus. So when I came to Christ in 1978, God the Father gave me to Jesus as a gift to Jesus. Uh, I didn't save myself, God saved me. I couldn't soften my heart, God softened my heart. I didn't choose him, he chose me. I don't understand it, even though I had to repent, even though I had to do things on my own volition, at the same time he was drawing me all these days, all my life, and I didn't even know it was him. And that's what Jesus is saying, that the Father gave people to him and then he said that those the Father has given him, he will not lose, meaning we are eternally kept by the power of God, by the grace of God, by his love. He shields us, and when we get saved, it tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse uh, 12 and 13, we are sealed until the day of redemption. That means he puts a, a, a seal, a deposit that he owns us. I'm no longer the devil's. My old nature no longer rules me. I am now a new creation in Christ. The old has gone. The new has come. I have to think God inside of me instead of me trying to get in God. God is in me. I have to have a new identity. I have to stop thinking like the world and understand that I am now a new created being in Christ. Even though I still have an old nature that attacks me, tries to get me to sin, I have a new nature that defines me and gives me the power to overcome sin by the blood of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so he says, I will never drive out those who come to me. I will protect them. I will not lose them. Wow, incredible promises. Verse 40, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. I will raise him up in the last day. Verse 41, the Jews grumbled. They didn't like this. They were all uh, centered on the law, on ceremony, on works. They grumbled and said uh, that, why did he say, I'm the bread that came down from heaven? Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? Uh, and so, how does he now say, I've come down from heaven? So they were judging Jesus by his earthly appearance. They were judging him by the fact that they were familiar with him because they saw him grow up in their hometown of Nazareth. They knew his mother and father. Maybe Joseph was still alive at that point. We don't know for sure if they were just talking about him in past tense. Uh, but they were thinking, how could this be the Messiah? Because we know his family. And sometimes when people know you well or knew you before you knew Christ, they judge you according to your old identity and they limit what God will do through you. And maybe they can't even receive from you the way they didn't want to receive from Jesus only because they were familiar with him and then they said well how does he say I've come down from heaven they were so confused because they didn't realize Jesus wasn't merely born Jesus was sent from heaven he wasn't just born of the Virgin Mary like everybody else he was literally conceived of the Holy Ghost and sent into the world to be the Savior of the world and that's why he was able to say, in spite of the fact he was born here and they knew his family, he was able to say, I, I was sent from heaven because he had a supernatural birth and God had a, an assignment on him to save us. 
So Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So what is he saying there? Well, you can't save yourself. And if you sense the Holy Spirit is convicting you now, yield. We can't take it for granted. The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. It says that in Isaiah 55, 7. And so if you sense the Holy Spirit drawing you back to Jesus today, say, Jesus, come in my life. Jesus, forgive me my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Save me. Come inside of me. Don't even wait until I finish preaching because it is the Father drawing you. You cannot tell the Father when to draw you to Jesus. You can't say, okay, I'm going to put it off until I'm older. I want to have my fun now. By the time you're older, you might have such a hard heart, you may not even want to believe in Jesus and give your life to him. You can't say, well, I'm in the middle of work right now. Uh, later on, uh, let me pray. Well, you could take a five-minute break and give your life to Jesus right now. When you sense the Holy Spirit is drawing you, that's the Father saying, I want you to come to my son now. If you could take a moment to listen to this on YouTube, then you could take a moment to pray. And so Jesus says, no one could come to the Father unless he draws him, come to him rather, unless the Father draws him, and I will raise him up the last day, verse 45. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught of God. Everyone who, who heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to Jesus not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. And so what he's saying there is in spite of all their biblical studies, if God the Father was teaching them, uh, was not teaching them, then they wouldn't come to Jesus. So he's saying that they had to be taught of God. He was talking to people that knew the Old Testament scriptures, knew priests, had been instructed in the law. But Jesus is saying it's not just getting instructed in the law. It's letting God himself teach us, and that's why we need the Holy Spirit to teach us the Word of God. We need people who are inspired by the Holy Spirit in the church to teach us. Uh, uh, God uses other people, and primarily he uses the Spirit of God as the great teacher to teach us. And the way we know it's true doctrine is by seeing how more mature Christians in our local church are interpreting the scriptures and what they think about what we're learning. It's important to learn together as a community to keep us in check and to counterbalance any false radical beliefs. And then he said in verse 47, Truly I say to you, whoever believes, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna, that little coriander bread, in the wilderness and they died this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die I am the living bread that has come down from heaven if anyone eats of this bread he will live forever and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh and then they got all confused saying how could this man give us his flesh to eat and then he dug in his heels and said unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood you have no life and um, he says in verse 57, As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. Whoever feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread your fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And Jesus said these things as he taught in the synagogue at Capernaum. And so he's talking about giving his flesh and his blood for the world. He so loved the world that whoever believes in him should not perish. No matter where you are, whatever your ethnic background, your religious background, you could be a practicing Buddhist, Muslim, Mormon. You could give your life to Jesus right now and believe that he is God the Son. Believe that he died for you. He rose from the dead. He gave his flesh for the life of the world, not just for Christians. And what we have to understand is once you come to Jesus and you become a Jesus follower, you will now be a true Christian, uh, and you might be a better Christian than those born in so-called Christian families. 
And so Jesus' flesh is for the life of the world. If you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and confess that with your mouth and confess that Jesus is Lord, your Lord, you will be saved. And what we do every week in our church is we have Holy Communion. We depict the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, especially his crucifixion. When we eat the bread, uh, that's his body that was broken. It's like he said, if you eat his flesh and drink his blood, you will have eternal life. So the wafer we eat is not literally his flesh, but it is symbolically portraying what he did. And so we're partaking of his body by faith. We're drinking the cup, the juice, and that's his blood by faith. And we have to understand that we need to do that with the church. So we cannot be Christ followers in isolation. And we need to love one another and care for one another. And that's another way we love God and follow Jesus. And so if Jesus is tugging on your heart today, um, seek him. Allow him in your life. There is nobody else who will satisfy your soul. There's a lot of trying days right now, uh, great political turmoil. We just came through and more yet to come probably. COVID has wrecked havoc in the economy. Maybe, maybe some of you are really dealing with financial pressure. Some have even gone bankrupt. Uh, many of you just lonely. There's more suicides today, even in middle school of the New York City than we've ever seen. Suicide rates have gone up across the nation, probably the world. And it's because if we look to anything else, we look to our government, it will fail us. If we look to our family, it can fail us. Our spouse can't even meet every need that we have. Only Jesus is the bread of life. And so if you want to come to him today, I want to lead you in prayer, a prayer of commitment to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So you could repeat this after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I thank you for satisf satisfying me with eternal life by giving your flesh for the life of the world. I speak with my mouth that you are my Lord. I surrender my life to your Lordship. I believe in my heart God raised you from the dead and that you're here right now in my room while I'm watching this video. Jesus, come in my life. Take me. I'm yours. And give me the power to follow you. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, please let us know. We want to stay in touch with you. You just made a decision. But Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You have to continue, and you need the church to know how to continue. So God bless you. We hope to see you live and in person. Soon we'll be having two uh, services, and we're growing, and God is moving very powerfully in our campuses, and we pray that you will also Listen to every one of these seven I am statements of Jesus so you will grow. In Jesus' name, amen.